This lecture is in conjunction with your online reading, Understanding Contemporary Art, and also this lecture is intended to be an introduction to a very important methodology that art historians use to interpret modern art, and that is formal analysis. Now, modern art is something that can be a little bit scary to people. And it's scary to people because it's something that's very unfamiliar. And your article actually did a really good job in addressing this by actually giving this sense of unease that people feel about modern art a name. And that is the Semmelweis reflex. And basically the Semmelweis reflex is this um, natural human tendency to reject new ideas. And modern art certainly is a new idea. And so we look at something like Jackson Pollock's number five, which is the squiggly lines, you know, everywhere. And people um, tend to reject this because this isn't what we are accustomed to seeing in art, which should be representational, depicting objects that are clearly recognizable. Um, perhaps this idea that just squiggly lines everywhere that traditionally should not be considered art so that is a new idea that people tend to reject people tend to want to look at something from the real world and it's really hard for us to understand this oh what's Jackson Pollock trying to say when all we're looking at is squiggly lines everywhere this is too far removed from the everyday experience and really at this point all we can really think is that oh we can only guess at the meaning but this is the beauty of formal analysis you can look at something like squiggly lines everywhere and you can actually analyze the work and yeah, you might be guessing a little bit, but you'll be making an educated guess, which is really a lot better than just a random uh, whatever guess. Here's another example, and this is by the artist Franz Klein. And in your article, in your reading, the uh, author focuses a lot, quite a bit, on abstract expressionism as um, to you know illustrate her points and so I have chosen artwork that she discusses in the article and I have also chosen to include in this lecture only work that comes from the style of abstract expressionism so the Pollock work that we just looked at was abstract expressionism as is the one that we're seeing here and just a little bit of um, a background here abstract expressionism was an American style and it actually was considered to be the first truly modern art style that came out of America. In many ways it was a response to the Second World War where people were looking for new ways to document their experiences and it tends to be in very emotional ways, very expressive, hence the name abstract expressionism. It's called abstract because we tend to see um, works of art that are not realistic, that they are um, highly abstract, or in the case of this piece, as well as the Pollock piece, they are non-representational, where we cannot see anything recognizable from the natural world. Now, when we look at work like this, it's seen to be as very modern, right? This idea of modern art. And I kind of mentioned this a little bit um, in your reading in Canvas, this idea. And it's also um, addressed in your article that you have modern art and then um, you have postmodern art, which comes a little bit later. And then finally, contemporary art, which is the art that's um, being made today and art that has been made in the recent past. And again, this is very experimental. At the time, this was groundbreaking and never been seen before. And so I just want to address really quick this idea of what exactly makes something modern, postmodern, contemporary. And again, it's this idea of being experimental, of trying new things that had never really been done before. So you have here two examples of landscape, okay, a, a um, traditional versus non-traditional. You have Helen Frankenthaler, who is an abstract expressionist artist, who, as you can see, has created this non-representational piece that is meant to be a beach. 
I've compared this with another beach scene, sea scene, by the artist Thomas Kincaid. Now, if you compare the two, Frankenthaler's was made in 1958, and Thomas Kincaid's was made in 1992. Even though Kincaid's work is much more contemporary in terms of time period, not artistically, but in terms of time period, actually Frankenthaler's work would be seen as much more modern and much more um, experimental. So we don't necessarily look at modern and contemporary art strictly through date, but more so what artists are trying to do. And actually um, a lot of people do like Kincaid's work. They find it to have a certain level of um, you know, visual appeal, but it is widely rejected by art historians. And one of the reasons why is because this really is not something that's considered to be contemporary or modern at all. Basically what Kincaid is doing is re he's re-articulating the style of romantic landscape painting, which was a style that was popular back in the late 1800s. Um, also, his work seems to be a little over the top in terms of sentimentality, uh, nostalgia, things like that. It's a little too um, cliche. So just because something was made recently doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be modern or experimental. Most people would not um, consider Kincaid's work to be contemporary in that traditional sense of trying new things and adding to the development of art. Okay, so formal analysis. So we have then these works of art and they're very challenging because they're basically just like squiggles and shapes and it's very difficult to try to determine what a work of art means. And with formal analysis, this is a really good approach for us to use because we're actually analyzing these lines, these shapes, and colors. So we have this piece that's by Mark Rothko, who also was an abstract expressionist. And uh, we can look at this piece, and as I said at the beginning of the lecture, really only kind of guess what we're looking at, but we can do so in a much more educated way through the use of formal analysis. Now formal analysis is um, a pretty intuitive way to analyze artwork, and um, it's also very helpful in the sense that it's broken down into three steps, identify, analyze, and interpret. With the identify phase of formal analysis, all you're doing is you are identifying certain visual elements, formal elements, they mean the same thing, certain formal elements or principles of design, then that's all you do is identify it. So, oh, I see this type of shape, I see this type of line. Then the analyze part is where you attach importance or symbolism or a message to that formal element. The idea is that artists do not just randomly or accidentally choose to use certain types of lines or shapes or colors, but that they actually are very strategically selecting them to communicate a message. The analyze portion of formal analysis is trying to determine why they chose what they chose. And then in the interpret part, you kind of bring it all together and you try to determine meaning. Now, I tend to, when I conduct formal analysis, I tend to do the identify and the analysis, and analysis part at the same time. I don't break it up because it just feels a little redundant to me. So what I tend to do is I'll identify and then immediately try to determine significance. So I just wanted to point that out because um, it might be kind of confusing. Now I have two examples um, for us to look at how formal analysis operates and what I suggest if you want to practice is perhaps after this lecture is over, you can go back to the first image, the Pollock image, or you could even try it with the Klein image and sort of practice formal analysis on um, these. I also have an additional video that I highly recommend watching that will give you another example of formal analysis. So you have access to three examples total, and hopefully that'll get, be enough to kind of give you an idea of how this works. So, formal considerations, okay. Now, Let's talk first about line. Now there's many, many types of line, okay? but I'm just going to address the types of line that we see Rothko selecting. And there's a few different types that he's chosen. Okay. Now, first of all, 
he has chosen to use, even though they're kind of fuzzy, he's chosen to use what are called analytical lines, which are sharp, straight lines. Okay, these are in um, contrast. If I can go back for a moment to anal or excuse me, expressive lines, which is what we see at the Pollock work, lines that go everywhere. Expressive lines, they express. They express, um, you know, anything. In the case of Pollock's work, he lived a very difficult life. He was an alcoholic. He was depressed. And these expressive lines were meant to convey the angst that he felt, the sort of pouring out of emotion, using line onto the canvas. Whereas with analytical line, rather sharper, straighter lines, we tend to see these as more controlled. They don't quite express in an intense way as we see with Pollock. Now we have other lines here in the sense that these lines are um, they're vertical. Okay, so vertical lines convey a sense of height. You can argue that they convey a sense of power. Um, you could argue that they are masculine. So we have vertical lines. We also have horizontal lines. Horizontal lines tend to convey a sense of calming. So because they're, they're long and they're flat and you think of like a horizon, things like that. Okay, so let's try to frame this with informal analysis. Okay, so we see these lines here and you have your horizontal line, identify, conveys a sense of calm, analyze. Okay, vertical line, and that's where you identified. Analyze maybe conveys a sense of height or power or masculinity. And then the analytical line, this idea of, of a control, sort of more austere form of expression. Now let's move to shape. Now the shapes here, because Rothko has used analytical lines, they come together, they create squares or rectangles. These are called geometric shapes. And they have the same uh, psychological effects as the analytical lines that tend to be a little bit more controlled, more austere. So even though Rothko is expressing something here, he is an abstract expressionist, it's a little bit more controlled than the kind of craziness that we see here. And this is a little bit crazier as well. And these are the other, I would say this would be the other type of shape, biomorphic or organic regularly shape shape. Okay, now space, okay, compositional space. With compositional space, what you're trying to determine is how much of what we're looking at, in this case squares, how much of the compositional space does that subject occupy? Where here it occupies almost the entirety of the compositional space. So it's authoritative, there's a strong visual presence. The subject, the squares, are not like kind of drowning or being overwhelmed in empty space. So you want to always consider that. Color. Now I put here a color wheel that shows us color relationships. And there's two primary types of color relationships that we'll look at in this class. One, which we see here, is an analogous color scheme. Analogous color scheme are colors next to each other on the color wheel. So we see primarily oranges and reds. You can see they're next to each other on the color wheel here. With the analogous color scheme, the um, colors flow and transition into one another. So they're very harmonious within the eye. This is in contrast to a complementary color scheme. Colors opposite on the color wheel. And so like for example, complementary color scheme would be red and green orange and blue. Now complementary, they might think, oh, they complement the colors. They, they get along, they're friends, but they're not friends. They don't get along. They're very jarring visually. They contrast in the eye. Complementary color schemes tend to make the viewer uncomfortable because they're so contrasty. Whereas there is a certain level of visual peace and harmony with your anal analogous color scheme. So identify analogous color scheme, analyze sense of harmony scale. Scale is an important one to consider. And scale refers to size. Here this piece is approximately 8 feet by 7 feet. 
that's large. Imagine how it would feel to stand in front of something that large. You're going to be sort of engulfed or enveloped by this, these colors, these squares. So that communicates something um, maybe perhaps of importance. Large size tends to convey importance. It can also convey power. Material. This is a little bit more important when you're talking about three-dimensional artwork that tends to use a variety of materials. We will talk about formal analysis and the use of material when we begin our lesson on modern sculpture, which will be later on in the semester. And then title. Title is not necessarily a formal consideration, but I do find it can be helpful in interpreting the artwork. Here the title is red, orange, and yellow. Um, so Rothko's not exactly giving us a lot to work with in terms of the title. Now, we've conducted the first two parts of the formal analysis. Now we go to the interpretation phase. Okay, So basically, we can look at things like, okay, Rothko uses horizontal lines, which are calming. He uses vertical lines, which can convey a sense of height. Now, when I think about height, I think about those tall churches that were built by, uh, you know, mid medieval period Christians. I think about the idea of when you look at height, you look up. When you see the sky, perhaps you think of God. The reason why I'm bringing up this idea of calming and spirituality is because it talked about in that article this modernist belief that we see embraced by people like Vasily Kandinsky, Kazmir Malevich, and Mark Rothko, their argument that art belongs to a higher spiritual realm. And if we interpret this piece based on that, his use of line makes sense. Um, you could say that putting together the calming lines, the height of the vertical lines, that this could um, perhaps convey a sense of stability. Um, this idea of conveying emotion and feeling emotion, but in a controlled and stable way, not all crazy like Pollock. Uh, the haziness also gives it a sense of uh, peace. Um, and so the idea perhaps is that we're looking at, you know, this emotion that is controlled. Um, it's not really that intense. And um, perhaps it is referencing spirituality. Now, I'm aware that I'm not giving the most concrete interpretation here, but with something like this, when you're looking at squares, some subjectivity is expected. And I think with a lot of these people, and certainly this was the intent of Rothko, is ideally we meet in the middle. That what I come up with can meet in the middle with what Rothko intended. Let's try another one. Whoa, this one looks hard, right? Squiggly lines everywhere. And this is supposed to be two figures? Wow, very challenging. But not so challenging if we utilize formal analysis. Two figures by the abstract expressionist artist Willem de Kooning. All right, so let's take a look and uh, maybe you might want to practice on your own first, pause the video, try it out, and then come back and see how my analysis compares with yours. And it's okay if they don't match perfect, right? There obviously is going to be a little bit of a difference interpretation, and that's okay. That's kind of the point of, of modern art. Now let's take a look first at line. There's um, kind of a lot of line here. We do see some horizontal lines. Uh, we do see some vertical lines, uh, some diagonal lines, and uh, some expressive lines. Now, diagonal lines I didn't address in the previous um, slide. Here's some diagonal lines in here. Diagonal lines traditionally convey a sense of tension. They also can be considered dynamic because they move in different directions. Let's talk about shape. And for right now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do the identify phase. And then I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put together the analyze and the interpret. You could do whatever you want. That's the, the craziness of formal analysis. You could do all three separate. You could combine two. As long as you are coming to it with an interpretation, you have that freedom. So this time around, it works for me to, to uh, conflate the second two. Okay, so shape. Um, I would say that we have um, 
more of organic shapes rather than our geometric shapes of Rothko's piece. Um, and I want to talk about the, the quality of the shape. And you can certainly do this. I find that this um, work is very dense with a lot of shapes and that they're complex, that they interact, they um, overlap. Um, and these shapes, there's a lot of them. They take up almost the entirety of the compositional space. Now, color. We do have a little bit of complementary color scheme here, right? Here's some green, here's some red. But think about the intensity. It's not so intense. It's not like boom in your face, green, red, okay? De Kooning has muted this a bit. So there is a little bit of um, the contrast, but not so hardcore. And otherwise, we're seeing a painting that is consisting of a lot of neutral colors. Now, scale three feet by two feet. That's kind of a whatever scale, not too big, not too small. So I personally don't find that something that needs to get a lot of interpretive um, attention from me. Material, again, doesn't really matter. It's paint on canvas. Material is more of a um, consideration with three-dimensional art. Title, two figures. In this case, I do think that even though this seems like a vague title, this is what I am going to use to really hang on to um, when I start to interpret this piece. So two figures. And then texture. Now for something like Rothko, we could talk a little bit about texture. It's soft, it's hazy. Um, here texture is, if you look really up close, and I love these types of paintings, where it's thick, the brushwork is not blended like Rothko's was. It's really built up. And this type of brushwork is called impasto. So use an impasto stroke. Okay, so there's my formal analysis. Now, I'm going to analyze and I'm going to interpret at the same time. Now, what I think this work is about is I think this work of art is about complexity of relationships, romantic relationships. That's what I think it's about. Now, I have to prove this, though. How did I come up with this? And this is where the formal analysis comes in. The analyze part is my proof. Okay, so complexity of relationships. So let's talk about texture, okay? Impasto texture. It's a rough texture, right? The idea that relationships could be rough. We also see that with his impasto technique, de Kooning is building up the surface of the uh, canvas with layers. And so I could say that relationships are layered, right? That there's many components to relationships. They're not myopic. Now let's talk about the line, right? These lines are crazy. They're expressive. They move everywhere. They change in directions. They change in quality. They change in appearance. The idea that perhaps relationships are always changing. The brushwork, I think, is pretty intense. Relationships can be pretty intense. Color, okay? Now we do have the complementary color scheme, which is contrast, right? And its contrast creates a sense of tension, right? So the idea that you can have tension in relationships, tension also is reinforced by de Kooning's use of diagonal line. But with the neutral color palette overall, it's the idea that there's tension sometimes, but not all the time. Now, with the shape, okay, these shapes, they, um, as I said, that they are kind of complicated, they overlap, they sort of dissolve into one another. It kind of makes me think a little bit about sex and idea of like merging, coming together like these shapes are doing. So there could be this, you know, kind of comment on, you know, the complexity of relationships, the intensity, and of course sex would be, I would think, a pretty big component of that. Um, and then we have like a really strong emotional component to this piece in the sense that you've got these these lines and we see the lines um, as de Kooning has made them. They, they haven't been blended away and we call these types of brushwork gestural brushwork. The gesture, the gesture, the movement of de Kooning is captured as he's creating this piece. Gestural work is considered to be especially expressive because you see the physical movement that the artist made when they are creating that work of art. So we have gesture captured in the brushwork, that's expressive. Organic shapes, which also are expressive. 
and then um, line, expressive line. And so all these things are meant to convey emotion, and I think we all know that motion is a huge part of what guides relationships. So um, we also have this thing called balance. Okay, balance is a design principle. With balance, you want things to be even, right? If you divide a composition in half, they should feel equally heavy, visually heavy on either side. But if you divide this in half, this side feels heavier to me because we have more of a buildup of stronger visual colors. These green, these reds, these pop out. We've got a complementary color scheme happening right here and over on this side not as much. So a little bit of unbalance which kind of pulls the eye this way, keeps pulling the eye this way. An unbalanced composition tends to create also a sense of tension makes people uncomfortable because people like balance they like things to be um, you know even and easy and if we go back this is like perfect balance perfect balance perfect symmetry and that makes people feel comfortable there's a lot of things here that make people feel comfortable about this this work it's not in your face there's it's certainly expressive but it's not this like crazy expression like we saw with Jackson Pollock's work lines everywhere or even with this um, work that we see here so here then are our examples of formal analysis. Again, I encourage you to watch my other tutorial that I have included in your Canvas shell to um, further practice this uh, form of analysis in modern art.